Hey everyone, how are you today? It is November 10th, November 10th, 2021. It's Brian Barron, Director of Skincare Research at Paula's Choice Skincare, here for our second YouTube live chat of the month. And the topic is how to build a skincare routine. So um, we're going to get into that in just a minute, but we will be covering um, some of the key points we'll be covering will be what is the uh, least amount of skincare you need to use to maintain healthy skin, when uh, should you start incorporating more products, and, and what concerns can they address, order of application, because that's a big question that you guys have, uh, how to know when you're overdoing it, uh, and, and others, uh, other burning questions along those lines. Of course, as always, I want to know what is on your mind regarding skincare routines. Uh, I would also love to hear your success stories. You know, what? how did you find that sweet spot for what really worked for you? Of course, we're going to be talking about skin type uh, and how that interplays with skin concerns. Um, but yeah, I, whether it's with our products from Paula's Choice uh, or somebody else's, uh, my, my chief uh, care in that regard is that the products are well formulated. If they're from somebody else and that you're getting great results from them or you're mixing them with Paula's Choice, fantastic. Uh, even better, of course, if it's all Paula's Choice, but I also recognize that our brand may not have everything to check off, you know, every box when it comes to your needs and personal preferences because, of course, that always plays a factor. So on the last live chat I did, um, we were uh, two, a couple days away from Halloween, I think, maybe two, three days away. Yeah, roughly three days, I think. Uh, and and I was a little dressed up. Um, but on Halloween proper, I'm normally the one that takes our son out to trick or treat. Uh, he's six right now, and of course, that's just like one of the peak ages for uh, just being able to observe kids really enjoying Halloween and, and really appreciating it just as a fun kids holiday. Um, so I wanted to share with you a little photo. I don't know how you'll be able to see this, but my husband took our son trick or treating this year. Uh, and he was dressed as, uh, the, the son was dressed as uh, a character called Steve from Minecraft, which is a video game. Um, he's not allowed to play video games yet, but he knows that character. And my husband was dressed as a giant chicken. So I will hold this up here, see if you guys can spot that. That was taken <laughs> before they headed out. Um, and wow, what a difference a year made uh, on that trick-or-treating journey. It was so wonderful um, to be able to uh, go up and... and talk to people and you know, just kind of do trick-or-treating the way it's almost always been done. You know, where you go up to someone's door, ring the bell, knock, they answer, they hand you a candy, or if they don't hand a candy, then you have a decision to make. Are you going to do a trick or, you know, move on to the next house and hope that they have a treat? Uh, so just a huge change from 2020 when I took him out and, uh, you know, same neighborhood and the majority of houses had just set out a little card table or similar with pre-bagged candy that it was sort of a grab and go type thing. And, you know, while the, um, the end result kids getting candy was the same, the whole, there was just the whole experience of that interaction with other people was just, it wasn't there. Um, you know, and, and I missed that and I'm glad it was back this year. Um, before we dive into the topic, I thought it would be kind of fun also to share, um, a product from Paula's Choice that I pretty much always have around, but I have really come to appreciate it more recently. I don't know if this is the same for you guys, but every now and then, and it may have something to do with the season changing, because here in Michigan, we are definitely getting into colder weather, uh, the, the humidity is going down, and I'm starting to notice... Um, <clears throat> My skin is just kind of being more temperamental. And uh, I haven't changed anything about my routine per se, um, but one of the things that all from, from Paula's Choice that I always seems to get my skin back on track when it's acting up, whether it's, uh, and I'll have like drier patches or areas that are, you know, sensi more sensitive or irritated, uh, or even some minor breakouts um, that I'm not quite sure what triggered them, but you know, does it really matter? I want to get rid of them, right? Uh, so I'll put on our azelaic acid booster and I am literally showing you 
my personal tube, you can see it's been, <laughs> you know, it's, it's definitely been used. This is not a, uh, a camera ready uh, version, um, but it's just, it's just fantastic. I, I, I weave it into my routine usually at night. Um, so I'll cleanse, I'll tone, I will put on my leave on exfoliant and then I will put on the azelaic acid booster and finish with either one of our serums like the earth sourced power berry serum or, and, or a moisturizer. And, and now my, my go-to for a nighttime moisturizer is our Omega plus complex moisturizer. I just love the texture. I think it's a really, really good middle of the road uh, elegant creamy texture without being greasy and for if for someone like if you're like me and you have combination skin where your t-zone is oily but not as oily as it used to be and your cheeks are on the normal side but moving towards drier it's just it's uh it's just that perfect balance there so oh, I guess I don't need my glasses just yet that leads us to the first um, point uh, of the of today's topic how to build a skincare routine and, and that you it, you have to start with skin type it all comes down to skin type uh, there are most people uh, you know or scientists researchers who are uh, dermatologists uh, who uh, go on at length about this topic will comment that there are there are four main skin types there is dry there is oily there is combination and then there is what is often coined normal. Uh, some of the, the, the new speak that I've seen is uh, referring to normal skin as neutral skin, um, which I'm fine with. Uh, I think normal is a more identifiable word. It's just kind of that uh, your skin isn't too dry, it's not too oily. It's, it's kind of like the Goldilocks of skin types. It's, it's just right. Um, the frustrating thing about having normal or neutral skin is that it isn't likely to stay that way for very long. At some point, either due to uh, intrinsic aging, just what happens to all of us as we get older, no matter what else we do, uh, or extrinsic aging, which is the amount of um, environmental damage we've uh, accumulated and, and other things in our environment known as exposome factors that we've been exposed to. Uh, throughout our lives, uh, including what we eat and you know what we've eaten over the course of our lives, uh, supplements, level of pollution, um, blue light exposure, all of those things, um, they can play a role in changing what's considered a normal or neutral skin type into something that is not, you know, not the ideal anymore. Um, some. Experts would also consider sensitive skin a skin type. I lean more on sensitive skin being a skin condition or a skin concern. And the reason for that is because sensitive skin can happen to anybody. Uh, but it doesn't matter how dry you are or how oily you are. Now, it can certainly be said that the drier your skin is or the thinner your barrier is, uh, the more the more sensitive your skin is, the more you know. If you're looking at sensitivity on a on a scale, you know, from one to ten, somebody with oily sensitive skin may rate like a three or four on the sensitivity meter, uh, whereas somebody who has drier skin and an impaired barrier, their sensitivity marker may be as high as eight, nine, or ten, uh, depending. And in that situation, I think you also have what I consider more um, reactive skin, which I look at as a subset. Of sensitive skin. Some people can have sensitive skin that would be like mildly sensitive. Some people have what I consider more highly reactive skin. They're, it's you know you are the person that is always struggling to find the right products for you because no matter what you use, at some point it almost always tends to cause some sort of sensitivity issue for you, even if it's fragrance free and doesn't contain any known irritating ingredients. So. Once you know your skin type, uh, and you know, or you think you know your skin type, and we have articles on paulschoice.com that you can check out in our expert advice section on how to determine your skin type, and and then several different articles on how to take the best care of that skin type. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that skin type is fundamental to choosing to building out that routine, and uh, you also need to keep in mind that skin type 
uh, isn't static. It is going to change with time. It can change with seasons. It definitely changes with age for many of us. Um, one more thing to comment on regarding skin type is that some researchers or derms will also um, consider acne a skin type. Again, I disagree on that, just like for sensitive skin. Um, although I could almost give a little bit more leeway for sensitive skin being a skin type, but acne is something that any skin can experience. People who have oilier skin are, in theory, more likely uh, to have acne, but we have talked with many, many people over the years, um, we being the collective Paula's Choice um, team that interfaces with the public, uh, who have acne and dry skin. So it isn't necessarily just a marker of oil being you know, tied with acne. It often is, but it doesn't have to be, which is why I don't consider acne a skin type. It's more of a, it's a skin condition, it's a skin concern. Um, the basics, the least you need to use in order to have a, a workable routine, no matter your skin type, foundationally it comes down to a cleanser that you could use morning and evening. If you have really, really dry skin, uh, and you're not wearing uh, heavier sunscreen or heavier makeup, you um, probably don't need to use a cleanser more than, than uh, once a day at night. Um, but I generally advise washing. If you're using a nice mild cleanser appropriate for your skin type, there should not be any issue with using it in the morning as well. I like that it removes the buildup of dead skin cells and, and debris on the surface of skin, uh, as well as any residue from the products you applied the night before. Uh, and I think that's, that's important when you have drier skin because when you have drier skin, you have a tendency to want to go toward those heavier, more emollient uh, products that uh, if you don't get that, that excess residue off, it can interfere with how your AM skincare routine goes on. And then if you wear makeup, it can also interfere with how your makeup goes on as well as how long your makeup lasts throughout the day. So I am definitely a proponent of cleansing morning and evening, no matter your skin type. But uh, as with all of these suggestions that I'm going to make, uh, you will need to experiment to find out what works best for you. Um, as frustrating and complicated as skincare often seems and in fact is, uh, the other wrench that gets tossed into the mix is that a lot of it comes down to uh, experimenting to discover what works best for your skin and what works best for your personal preferences. Along with cleanser, uh, you really only need two other products for the kind of the bare minimum routine. Um, none of you are gonna be shocked by this next one if you've watched any of my chats before. It's going to be a daytime moisturizer with sunscreen because protecting your skin from the UV light, that's the biggest environmental threat our skin faces. No matter its color, no matter your age, it is never too late to start protecting your skin from UV light. It is absolutely a myth that if you have more melanated skin that you don't need sunscreen. Uh, it can certainly be uh, debated or, or stated that you don't necessarily need to go for the super high SPFs because the extra melanin in your skin is providing some amount of protection. But interestingly, studies have shown that even on very, very dark skin, um, the natural or built-in SPF is really only between a four and maybe in some testing conditions up to a six. No dermatologist worth their salt would ever tell someone, regardless of their skin color, that you can get away with just using an SPF four to six on a daily basis. You need at least an SPF of 15, SPF 30 even better uh, if you have darker skin. If you have lighter skin like me, I would definitely say SPF 30 is, is your, your bare minimum. Uh, and, and going up from there is, is even better. And the primary reason for that is that most of us aren't applying sunscreen to our face and neck as liberally as we should in order to get the stated level of protection. Um, and if you are applying, say, 50% as much as what's necessary to reach SPF 30, the thinking is you're getting at least SPF 15 to 20 in that range, or maybe SPF 18, uh, and therefore, you know, that's, that's considered good enough uh, unless you live in a very, very sunny climate. But circling back, moisturizer with SPF, definitely the critical daytime product after cleanser. At night, you would wash with the same cleanser and then you would put on a nighttime moisturizer or 
serum. And some people who have oilier skin may prefer the lighter weight texture of a serum. However, you can certainly find uh, traditional facial moisturizers that are have a gel or a gel cream or even more of a milky fluid type texture. And those can be ideal for oily skin to give it that uh, the hydration element that it still needs, as well as those key groups of ingredients that all skin types benefit from. Your antioxidants, your skin replenishing ingredients like the glycerin and the hyaluronic acid, the ceramides, the skin restoring ingredients, peptides, retinol, niacinamide are some examples uh, in that grouping. Uh, those categories of ingredients are what everyone's skin needs uh, to look and feel its best uh, and to keep it looking younger as long as possible. Now branching out uh, to build your routine past those very, very basic three, three products. Uh, the next product to add in uh, for most of us would be a leave-on AHA alpha hydroxy acid or BHA beta hydroxy acid exfoliant. Now that may be something that you don't necessarily need to use twice a day, you may find that once a day usage works great for you. You may find that once every other day or every second day is your sweet spot. And you may find, as I have, that going back and forth between BHA and AHA is a really nice balance and it gives you the benefits of both. I don't typically recommend people layer two different exfoliants at the same time. Um, if, if one is carefully formulated to get that exfoliating job done, you generally don't need to add another one right on top of it uh, if, it's, if they're both going to be leave-on. There are some higher strength uh, exfoliants that combine AHA and BHA, like our Skin Perfecting Peel, that you can use, say, once a week. But that is uh, products like those are typically designed to only be left on skin for a brief period of time and then rinsed off. Whereas the daily use exfoliants, the ones that have 1 to 2% salicylic acid and 5 to 10%, that's the typical range, for your AHAs like glycolic and lactic acid, uh, those can be used more often. But again, in that category, it comes down to experimenting to see uh, how your skin does uh, and with the frequency of exfoliation. Some skin types and some concerns will definitely find that, that they do beautifully with twice daily use of a leave-on exfoliant. But if you're new to that group of products, uh, I do think that it's worth starting slowly and noting your skin's response. And then you can always you know, increase frequency of use as needed or scale it back a little bit because you may discover based on how your skin responds that maybe the exfoliant that you decided to start with is a little bit too strong for you. You know, maybe your skin, or maybe your skin will do better with AHA than BHA. Generally, AHAs uh, are the preferred choice for normal to dry skin showing signs of sun damage and rough texture. BHA, are, are, which is salicylic acid, is the exfoliant of choice for somebody who has uh, more congested skin, clogged pores, redness, because BHA is naturally soothing due to its relation to aspirin. BHA also has a significant uh, advantage for oily and acne prone skin because it is oil soluble. So it actually can penetrate further into the pore lining and cut through that oil, uh, which glycolic and lactic acid, to name just two AHAs, are not able to do because they are naturally water soluble. However, there is definitely newer research emerging showing that the role that AHAs can have in reducing the appearance and the prevalence of breakouts. So Again, experiment. Beyond that, in terms of building out the basics and, and creating more of an advanced, full-fledged routine, I definitely am a big advocate for a serum because those typically tend to be more concentrated formulas that can give your skin extra amounts of those antioxidants and replenishing and soothing ingredients. Serums often tend to be a bit more targeted, uh, either towards certain concerns um, or uh, in some cases, they can be addressed more for a, a skin type. For example, our skin balancing serum, the texture of that, uh, it, it dispenses almost like this uh, fluffy type gel. Uh, but then when you put it on, it just it almost immediately morphs into this super smooth, velvety soft, but 
almost weightless powder dry finish. And then you look at our Skin Recovery Serum, which is in the, the dark red tube, that's more of an oil-rich formula that has more of that substantive emollient feel to it um, that people with dry skin really gravitate toward. Okay. Uh, oh, another thing to build out the routine that I think a lot of people can benefit from, uh, if the skin around your eyes is showing uh, signs of aging at a more marked pace than the skin on the rest of your face, or if you're noticing that the skin around your eyes is looking and feeling drier than the rest of your face, I do think there is a place in a, uh, as you build out your routine for a special product for the eye area. Um, I resisted no offense to our resist line. I resisted using an eye cream for years myself. I, I was using most, in fact, I don't think I used an eye cream regularly throughout my 20s or early 30s at all. I would use my facial moisturizer, uh, which for a, the, a very long time was the Paula's Choice Skin Balancing Moisture Gel. Uh, I would use that around my eyes. I would use my leave-on exfoliant. I mean, pretty much anything I put anywhere else on my face except for anti-acne products like a benzoyl peroxide, I would also use around my eyes. Then I got into my late 30s, early 40s, and I started noticing some changes around my eyes that uh, I didn't like. Uh, and, and one of them was that my original, my regular moisturizer just wasn't cutting it. Um, and I would experiment with using a heavier facial moisturizer around my eyes and there was always one thing or another about the texture that I just didn't enjoy as much around the eyes. Uh, and so when we finally formulated our first eye cream, uh, which actually came about due to consumer demand when, when we did this incredibly broad survey of our customers and we asked them, what's the one product that you're buying from another brand that you would like to see Paula's Choice offer? Eye cream was the overwhelming response. And we were very aware that a lot of the eye creams on the market were not well formulated. Uh, they came in jars, which isn't good for those delicate ingredients, not to mention also presents a hygiene issue because most eye creams are water-based. Um, water is a great medium for all kinds of um, not so fun microorganisms and pathogens to grow and multiply. Ew. Um, we knew that we had to make an eye cream and that it had to be special and uh, I, I've been using our original eye cream for quite some time now um, and I don't want to be without it. So I'm at that age now as I'm solidly in my late 40s that an eye cream has become an indispensable, non-negotiable product for me. Um, let's talk, let's see, we're getting towards the midway point. I definitely see your questions uh, and I want to get to those. Um, order of application. Generally, uh, there's some negotiables and some non-negotiables in, in the order of application. Cleansing is always going to be first. Obviously, there's no point in like having cleansing be step three washing off what you've just put on that you want to benefit your skin and it will benefit your skin if you just leave it on there so you don't want to wash it off. So cleanser is step one. If you are using a toner, I'm also a big fan of toners. I, I will die with a toner bottle in my hand, I'm convinced. Um, I just think that what they give back to skin immediately after cleansing, how soft they can make skin feel, how good they can be at getting those missed areas uh, of makeup or sunscreen after you've cleansed. You know, it's it's tip, it's hard to get that cleanser like right along the hairline without really gumming up the hair uh, or making sure that your cleanser reaches every single crevice around the eye. Uh, now I know some of you use an eye makeup remover for that purpose and that's great, but I'll, I'll kind of use my toner in that area and it's never been an issue. Um, so I just think toner has a lot of value. Um, if you're just building your routine and you're feeling a little bit like, okay, like three products max, Brian, step back. Then you, you can not worry about the toner for now. Get used to a three or a four product routine morning and evening and, and see how you do and, you know, get your baseline, you know, and then you can build uh, if you want to. But uh, assuming we're talking a full-fledged routine, toner would be step two. Step three would be your leave-on exfoliant, whether it's an alpha or beta hydroxy acid or a polyhydroxy acid. Yes, there is another group. That would be gluconolactone or lactobionic acid. Uh, that is not the type of, or a type of exfoliant Paula's Choice currently offers, but they are out there from other brands, most notably Neostrata. 
during the day, if you use a serum twice daily and uh, or a booster type product, like for example, our C15 booster, excellent product to put on during the day because vitamin C has been shown in several studies to help boost your skin's environmental defenses in the presence of UV light. It's not a sunscreen, but it definitely helps your sunscreen be even more effective at thwarting those free radicals that UV light can generate in the skin. Um, not to mention, ongoing exposure to UV light can deplete your skin's natural supply of vitamin C over time. Uh, so giving it back becomes more and more important, especially as you get older. So your Levon exfoliant is on. We're doing our daytime routine. You're, you can either apply a booster or a serum. Some people uh, would like to put on both because they just, you know, they, they're fine with doing extra steps during the day. Which goes on first, the booster or the serum? It really depends on texture. Whichever one of those is lighter goes on first, and then the next lightest or the next heaviest product goes on after that. If the two products are of similar textures, let's say they're both a fluid type gel, personal preference, experiment with one on, you know, then reverse and see what, see what you like best. Next up for the day would be a uh, sunscreen, uh, which is always the last skincare product that you apply. Anything applied over a sunscreen, a type of a skincare product, is going to, uh, in some fashion, uh, dilute its effectiveness. And people will often say, well, what about putting makeup on over a sunscreen? If you are careful with your foundation, if it's, let's say it's a liquid or a cream foundation, what you want to do is make sure that when you put your foundation on over your daytime moisturizer with sunscreen that you are gently uh, applying it. You're not applying in a back and forth massaging like rubbing motion that's going to be removing that sunscreen. Best case scenario or best approach to really make sure uh, that you're keeping that sunscreen on the up and up so to speak is to um, follow your daytime moisturizer with sunscreen with a foundation that also contains sun protection. There are several of them out there in different formats. Uh, we love layering sunscreen because as I mentioned earlier, most of us don't apply uh, as much as what's needed to get to that stated level of sun protection. So then the more SPF rated products you can layer into your daytime routine, the more protection you're going to go out to, you know, and face the day with. Um, if you use an eye area product during the day, some of, some of you like using a lighter weight item like a gel, that would go on um, as the step before your sunscreen. <clears throat> now at night, pretty much the same thing. You cleanse, tone if you use a toner. Uh, if you are using your leave-on exfoliant uh, morning and night, that would go on next. If you are using your leave-on exfoliant once a day, and morning is when you like to use that leave-on exfoliant, then you would proceed to the next step after toning, which would be serum and or booster. Now, some of you also like using uh, various treatment products at night. Uh, for example, our new clinical discoloration repair serum, if you have areas of discoloration. There's different schools of thought on where in the routine that should go. My thinking is it depends on the, the area that you are applying it to. And what I mean by that is anything I, I like to use, anything that you're, you're looking at as a spot treatment. I like having that be one of the last, if not the last products that I put on at night because I want it to stay as much as possible in the area where I apply it. So you have a little dark spot, maybe it's up here, maybe it's on the side of your forehead or in, you know down here on your cheek, but there aren't really any other dark spots on your face that are concerning. And you don't have that diffuse mask-like discoloration that you may also want to use a discoloration uh, product to fade. Then, totally makes sense, you put on your, your nighttime moisturizer, you use your eye cream if, if that's an item in your routine, and then you take that dark spot product and you dab it on as the last item where it's needed. So you're not putting something on over it that's immediately going to spread it away from the area where you want that concentrated application to remain. 
Same thing if you are using our BHA9, which is a 9% salicylic acid spot treatment for uh, those more stubborn imperfections or those rough bumpy areas. Most of us tend to not have that all over our face. We just have it in little areas or little patches. So I like using BHA9 uh, as the last or second to last step in my nighttime routine. Again, so I'm keeping as much of that product as possible where it needs to be. Now, another option you could consider, I told you this could get a little complicated, is that you could wait for, you could put that treatment product on prior to your nighttime moisturizer, prior to your eye cream, and just give that treatment time to absorb, time to set. And that will usually take, you know, five to seven minutes. Uh, I think it's a good uh, uh, amount of time to wait. But you also have to be okay with waiting uh, that, that long. And, you know, most of us want to get through our skincare routines as, as quickly and efficiently as possible. But if you want to take that extra time, that's up to you. If you, that's, you know, again, experiment, it's personal preference. Okay, uh, I think that covers order of application and layering. We'll check your questions to see if I completely confused you. Um, how to tell if you're overdoing it? How do you know, you know, you've got multiple concerns, you're using lots of different products, some of them have more bioactive ingredients. How do you know? How do you know when you've kind of tipped that scale toward, uh, toward your, your, your skin? Uh, well, let's just say you're, you are endeavoring to make your skin better, to get this, this visible issue to become less of a visible issue or just go away. But you're sensing or you're seeing that things are steadily getting worse. Um, <coughs> generally, the answer is to look for those, those clues. If you are seeing signs of redness, if you are seeing signs of flaky skin, if your skin is feeling uh, consistently too tight, almost like it's a size too small, um, or if your skin is just becoming more tender to the touch, uh, you may even experience what I refer to as a sunburn-like sensation on skin uh, but you don't necessarily look like you've been sunburned. Uh, there's not necessarily a color change, but your skin just really kind of feels like almost hot to the touch. That Those are all signs that you're overdoing it. Uh, and in most situations, it means that you're simply applying too many active products at one time. Uh, it does not mean that everything you've been using is now all of a sudden, you know, irritating your skin and therefore, you know, with one sweep of your arm, everything's in the trash, and you start all over again. Um, it does take some patience because you need to take a look at what you've been using and consider how many of those products are on the stronger side, even though they may be perfectly legitimate and great choices for your concern, how many of them are on the stronger side and therefore applying this stronger product with this stronger product with this particular product is the likely culprit for why your skin is acting up. And as I just mentioned, it doesn't mean that you have to stop using those products. It does mean that you need to consider spacing out those applications. So <clears throat> if you were typically applying all of your heavy hitting treatment products at night and you're starting to see some kickback from that combination, you can either, um, if you don't want to apply, if you don't want to separate by putting one or two of them on in the morning, one or two of them on at night, then you need to start alternating days. So for example, out of the four, let's say you're using four products that are, that are on the more active side, which if you have multiple concerns, it's not necessarily so unusual. Um, split it in two, so to speak. Take two products that you'll apply on a Monday night, the next two products go on Tuesday night, then you go back on Wednesday, put your two products from Monday on, and then on Thursday, you put your two products from Tuesday on, and so on and so forth. You will still get that benefit from all of those great ingredients in those products, but by spacing out, your, your skin is um, better able to acclimate and improve its tolerability to those ingredients, and you are taking that scale because it can be a balancing act and you're pu pushing it more toward the benefit getting the most out of those great ingredients as opposed to the combination 
being a little bit or a lot in some cases too much for your skin. Um, how long should you use skincare products and or skincare routine before you judge whether it's working? How effective is it? Generally, the advice, there isn't a hard and fast rule here. The general advice is to give the products and or routine at least four weeks of consistent use <clears throat> before you really make a, 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 a informed or before you're really able to make an, uh, an, an informed, fair decision. Um, obviously, if you're noticing signs of dryness or irritation or sensitivity ahead of that four-week uh, deadline, then yes, stop and, and, and reconsider in that moment and what, what you may need to change, what may be causing the problem. Um, but like if you're using an anti-acne routine, if you're using an anti-aging routine, um, you are new to using a leave-on exfoliant and you've got, you know, issues with enlarged clogged pores, give it at least a month and be consistent with your routine. Uh, you know, whether that means once or twice daily for some products, uh, you know, of course there's certain items, as I mentioned, like your cleanser and your sunscreen, uh, that are non-negotiable, but yeah, you just really need to take it, uh, pack some patience, stay consistent. If you're using well-formulated products and you're not seeing any signs of adverse reactions, please give it at least four weeks, maybe even six weeks. For um, the kind of outlier exception to that would be for a discoloration uh, treatment type product, regardless of whether it has uh, like tranexamic acid or hydroquinone or arbutin higher strength vitamin C treatments for discolorations. Um, the literature on that and the comparative studies over the years have pretty much solidly come down on 12 weeks, three months of at least once, preferably twice daily usage uh, to really assess how well it's working for you. And, and I get it because I am dealing with discolorations right now and you want them to you know, get noticeably better as soon as possible. And unfortunately, you know, again, pack your patience, the discolorations that you're dealing with now, if you're in my 40-ish age range, um, those have been festering, so to speak, below the surface for quite some time. Uh, and you're only now seeing them. Um, they're, if anything, they're, they're a testament to the cumulative and hidden uh, damage that we experience from UV light over the years. You know, you go out, you get a bunch of unprotected sun exposure as a teenager, you've got your lovely tan skin, you know, you think you look great, you know, you've got that sun-kissed glow. What you're not seeing bubbling beneath the surface of skin is, is all of those pigmentary changes that aren't going to become visible until years later. But they will become visible at some point, and that's when you're going to want to get that discoloration treatment, and that's when you're going to want those spots gone. But from a physiologic perspective, those were years in the making, you know, in terms of making their way to the surface and becoming more of a visual nuisance for you or a frustration for you. So I think those are all of the big topics I wanted to touch on in terms of how to build your routine. Um, other than the key tenets of always treating your skin as gently as possible, understanding uh, that fragrance-free is truly what's best for your skin, added fragrance, I, I, I get, a great smelling product is a great smelling product and it isn't that fragrance free products have to or always do smell bad. They most certainly do not. Um, if anything, I think a lot of those products, they smell neutral. They don't really smell like anything ex well, except the ingredients themselves. So, um, but it's just staying away from especially overly fragranced products and then sadly that includes essential oils. Um, which are much better for enjoying the uh, olfactory aromatherapy than putting on your skin. Um, your skin will thank you for, for laying off the, the fragrance, uh, particularly in, in products that also contain more active ingredients. Gianna says, hi, Brian. I really want to be able to wear the Youth Extending SPF 50 because I love the formula, but it pills on me. I let my skincare sink in, but it still pills. <clears throat> Any tips? Much love from Norway. So Gianna, um, I appreciate your diligence with that product. It is one of our most popular daytime moisturizers. 
one thing I would suggest trying if you haven't done so already is to um, reconsider what you're putting on <clears throat> in the morning with that and whether or not all of those non-SPF items are essential for you to apply in the morning or if you can shift one or all of them uh, to the nighttime. I, I'm, I would be curious to see if the Youth Extending SPF 50 would still pill on you if you just applied it to cleansed skin. Um, maybe put on a little layer of moisturizer or a light water-based serum before that uh, and then go with your Youth Extending SPF 50 and see if that helps. If it doesn't, I don't want you to keep using a product that is consistently pilling on you so the game starts anew, so to speak, and you'd need to start trying other uh, lightweight, excuse me, lightweight sunscreens. Um, another good one to consider from Paula's Choice is the Skin Restoring SPF 50, which is from our Resist line for normal to dry skin. That, uh, despite having a, a creamier texture than the Youth Extending SPF 50, it still feels fairly light uh, and yet hydrating on the skin. So that's another option that you could consider. Mrs. Flory W. says, Hi, Brian. No specific question today. Just wanted to thank you for taking the time to help us better understand skincare and answering all of our questions. All the best from New Zealand. Thank you, Flory. Um, I appreciate that. I really do. And I, I love that people from New Zealand and oftentimes from Australia are tuning into this. Um, Paula's Choice does have a presence there. We are available in that market. Um, and and I, I love it when people find us and, and they you know, feel like they finally found their perfect skincare. Susan, uh, and MCF1, do you have any idea when the Skin Recovery SPF 30 will be back in stock? It's my favorite sunscreen. I, uh, there, I know it's, it's very frustrating right now. We've got several items that are out of stock. Um, it's, believe me, it's just as frustrating for us. Uh, and, and believe me that the people on our supply chain team uh, and our suppliers outside of Paula's Choice are, are doing everything they can to get things back in stock as quickly as possible. Um, always making sure that we're doing due diligence, you know, during the manufacturing process and, uh, and, and we, everything goes through a quality control check before it's allowed to be sold. So we're, we're not compromising on those steps, uh, even though we want to get the products back on shelves, so to speak, as soon as possible. I don't know when that specific one will be back in stock. If, if I, memory serves, I, I'm thinking it's going to be in early December, but I don't want you to quote me on that. Um, but I can look at, let me make a note because I can come back and drop that in the comments. Um, I can look at our report and see when the next forecasted back in stock date is for that sunscreen. Um, if, let me check one thing, the SPF 30 product that we have in our Calm line is actually the same formula. And that is currently in stock. So I'm gonna, I'll see if I can drop that into the comments. And there you go. So you should see the link to that show up in just a second if it hasn't already. All right, moving on. Oh, Flory does have a question. Can I use the Calm 1% BHA and the Peptide Booster in the same routine or are they incompatible because of the pH of the BHA lotion? Thank you. you absolutely can. I do that all the time, Flory. There is it, the... When two skincare products in your routine have differing pHs, applying them one after the other, that does not throw off the pH of either one. You would need a lot of product and a lot of time in order to get that to happen. The ingredients like sodium hydroxide, just to name one, that are used in formulas to hold and establish a pH, they are very good at their jobs. They, they are able to keep the pH within a tightly controlled uh, spec or specification range so that the BHA uh, pH doesn't drift um, beyond four, which means it really is going to start losing its ability to exfoliate. And then the peptide booster, I think that's around a pH of six or 6.2. 
um, but they're not going to interfere with each other. You can absolutely layer them one after the other. Okay, uh, Adriana says, Hi, Brian. So happy to see you again. What do you think about LED masks, for example, from Dennis Gross? I haven't looked at that one in particular. My, my general uh, thought on such products is that the light that they emit is not going to be as strong as what you can get in a physician's office, a dermatologist's office from LED type treatments. Uh, there are, that's usually the reason for that comes down to legal issues. Um, they, you know, the, these products that are meant for home use by consumers, uh, obviously it's in the co company's best interest to not put something on the market that could easily be, be misused and cause the consumer to injure or otherwise harm themselves. Uh, there's also a tendency and, and companies like Dr. Dennis Groth, I suspect are aware of this, for people to use such devices more often, more frequently than they should. They, you know, the company does their due diligence and, and gives you the directions on how often to use the product and for how long. And a lot of consumers think, well, if three times a week for 10 minutes is good, then every night for an hour must be even better. Yet it isn't. I mean, that, that, that could potentially, uh, in theory at least, end up being problematic. So, um, I just, yeah, I, I don't know if you'd see much result. Uh, you may see, you may see some, and, and I don't mean at all to knock Dr. Dennis Gross skincare. I actually think they're one of the better skincare brands out there and have consistently been one of the better skincare brands out there. Um, but I just don't think that you would get the kind of results from any at home use LED mask that you could get from a dermatologist like Dr. Dennis Gross himself. Uh, Selkin says, why CBD products were discontinued? To my understanding, they were popular since they were often sold out. <clears throat> Any recommendation to replace retinol with CBD oil once my last bottle finished up? The long and the short of it is that neither one of the CBD products really took off. We actually did uh, lower quantities at launch than we normally would for such products just to kind of gauge uh, what the interest in them would be. Um, I still think CBD is a very exciting skincare ingredient. It's a very exciting ingredient for, for many things beyond the skincare category. Um, but particularly in the, in the realm of skincare, I, I think it's going, it's consistently showing to be one of the better topical and skin friendly, uh, soothing ingredients that we have. So I was sad to see them go Perhaps they'll be back uh, someday, <clears throat> particularly when uh, the regulatory landscape on uh, such products for skin becomes more clearly defined between countries. That was another frustration uh, that we and, and I'm sure other brands that, that offer or used to offer CBD products have encountered. Um, and in terms of a replacement for the retinol product, I'm not, I mean, there, there isn't, there is not an equivalent replacement from Paula's Choice that's going to give you CBD and that hemp seed oil and those other nice plant oils with the half percent retinol. <clears throat> you would have to use something like our clinical 0.3% Bacuchiol to, or sorry, 0.3% retinol, 2% Bacuchiol product along with a product like our Moisture Renewal Oil Booster. So another option would be like our Resist Intensive Wrinkle Repair Retinol Serum, which gives you 0.1% retinol, uh, along with either Moisture Renewal Oil Booster, or you could also pair that product, the Retinol Serum, with um, like the Resist Barrier Repair Moisturizer, which also has retinol in it. So it's, it's kind of like any way you slice it, you're not getting CBD and you're not going to get the same amount of retinol if, if half percent is what worked well for you. So, um, but we, you know, we are constantly looking at our product lineup and, and we know that a lot of people like that tiered approach to retinol, you know, where you have that kind of what, what some brands would call a step up program. You start at the beginner's level of retinol getting great results, you move up to the next level, 
still getting great results, you move up a little stronger, and then you kind of find where your skin's sweet spot with retinol is. So we're definitely looking at um, where we have some gaps in that regard, and and you know we'll we'll see what we come up with. Um, it's a really exciting area, actually. Okay, thank you, I'm on B for the comment. I'm glad you like the azelaic acid too. Tatiana says, I'm in love with the skin balancing, invisible finish gel. It leaves my skin so smooth and my makeup lasts longer than ever. It's still a fantastic product. Absolutely. Thank you for the feedback. Jean-Michael Felgari, hi Brian, I have a question. There are different opinions around denatured alcohol in skincare. I would like to know what can happen to skin when using it and why do so many SPFs use it? Uh, IG Laura Shapo. So there, there's definitely different schools of thought on denatured alcohol. I think the research is pretty clear that it, especially when it is a main ingredient in a leave-on skincare product, it can literally kill skin cells um, fairly fast and fairly efficiently. Uh, and it also is very good at um, damaging the substances that constitute skin's protective barrier. Um, and you can witness this yourself if you've been, especially in this uh, pandemic time, um, if you've been using hand sanitizer more often, uh, or washing your hands more often, or, or, or both, you've likely experienced how swiftly your hands uh, can become dry and cracked and very uncomfortable. That's because both the process of using those surfactants in the hand washes and constantly exposing skin to water, which water can literally dry out our skin. That's why just water alone isn't enough to deal with dry skin. But that that constant exposure to the surfactants in the water and then in between that you're using a high amount of alcohol to sanitize your hands. Um, it literally just chips away at those barrier substances like your the ceramides, the free fatty acids, the cholesterol, and skin cannot replace them fast enough. So that is what is meant when people say that denatured alcohol has a stripping effect on skin, which it absolutely does, uh, particularly in high amounts. Why is it used in so many sunscreens? Denatured alcohol, uh, separate from being an inexpensive ingredient, it's, it's a great solvent, meaning that you can mix several other types of ingredients uh, into uh, that solvent base and get the performance, the aesthetic attributes you want. For example, a spray that you, know, you can get those UV filters to spray on evenly, and then as you massage it into the skin, the UV filters are evenly distributed to protect your skin from UV light, and the alcohol uh, that, that carries them eventually evaporates. The problem though is that, again, those high amounts of alcohol uh, and a spray on sunscreen that's alcohol based can contain anywhere from 65 to 80, say 87% in some cases, uh, denatured alcohol, uh, along with a little fragrance and then your UV filters. They almost always contain fragrance because that much alcohol doesn't smell good. Um, the alcohol can cause some fairly swift damage to skin, uh, despite the fact that it, in high amounts it evaporates quickly. So there are other ingredients, there are other types of solvents, for example, uh, including some silicones that just do a much better job and they don't pose any risk of irritation to skin. And so our thinking is, even if there's some debate on just how bad denatured alcohol is or isn't for skin, why do you want to put something on your skin that's even you know subject to that level of debate? And there, there are certainly studies showing that alcohol does very swift and immediate harm to keratinocytes or skin cells. So why, why use it, particularly on a regular basis when there are so many great alternatives? And I say that fully acknowledging that there are great alternatives, not only from Paula's Choice, but from many other brands. So that's not not coming down on alcohol to promote Paula's choice. It's just, I'm telling you what the research has shown to be true. And, and in this case, it's the preponderance of research has come down um, against routine denatured alcohol use on skin versus, hey, you know, guys, it's really not that bad. There's far fewer studies in that regard. Okay, Tatiana, I think I took your question. All right, there's a few more. Tatiana, let me see if I have time to get back to you. We are kind of getting towards the end of the hour. 
Uh, is OPK high? Could you recommend a vitamin C product for acne sensitive skin? I, mm, <clears throat> well, if you haven't tried our C15 Super Booster, I think that is wonderful. I am also, I am also a fan of the 15% ascorbyl glucoside vitamin C product from the Inky List. Um, so you could look at that one as well. Um, it's a bit, well, not a bit. It's definitely is more bare bones than than our formula. I would definitely give the sophisticated, more multifaceted formulary edge to us in this regard. But if vitamin C is what you're after and you want it in a lightweight easily absorbed, non-pore clogging, fragrance-free base, the Inky List product is another option and one I've personally used um, and, and liked. So, I mean, I can vouch from an ingredient standpoint and from an anecdotal standpoint that I think that would be uh, another good option along with the C15 booster, one or, one or the other for sensitive acne-prone skin. Alex says, how do you feel about Japanese's sunscreens? Do you trust them? I really, uh, I haven't had much experience with them, Alex, so I don't feel it's 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 not my place to comment on them, um, and particularly in regards to to a level of trust. Um, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just, I can't, there's really not much else I can say uh, other than that. Uh, other than for a lot of the sunscreens coming out of Japan and Korea uh, that have a more fluid texture, they're very like thin, uh, sometimes a little um, milky fluid, those often do have a lot of denatured alcohol, you know, which helps create that texture and allows them to dry faster. So if, if that's what we're looking at, I wouldn't be a fan of those uh, types of sunscreens, no matter which country they're from. Art Girl Loves Paint. Great info. I have routines for each season, plus one for the Tret Peely, Tre Peely's when my dog goes up to Tret, oh, Tret Peely's when my dose goes up on Tretinoy. And next PC purchase is going to be the Omega Plus Complex Kit. Excellent. <clears throat> Melinda started using Retinol plus Bacuchiol almost two months ago, now using three evenings, okay? Other evenings, I use BHA plus 10% niacinamide. When is ideal time to add vitamin C into routine? I would, Melinda, I would use the vitamin C in the morning. I would use that as your serum or booster step under your sunscreen. I think that would be great. Um, meaning, should I add an AM or add to one? Definitely in the morning, Melinda. Try it in the morning because I, I think what you're using at night and the way you're alternating, I, I don't want to throw off that balance and I think vitamin C would be great for the daytime. Rebecca, what Paula's Choice products can I use with Emapel? And any of them. Any of them would be fine. There are no, I'm aware of Emapel. Uh, that is a, uh, a handful of skincare products for menopausal skin. There's no contraindications. Um, they do have that interesting ingredient in them that, uh, that they developed. Um, so from what I've seen of that ingredient, and this is my little caveat, uh, from what I've seen of that ingredient, I don't think there'd be any contraindications, but to be doubly sure, it wouldn't be a bad idea to contact the company and say, are there any skincare ingredients or types of products I shouldn't use at the same time as MFL? I'm like 99.9% .9 sure they are going to mimic my answer and say no contraindications whatsoever but it wouldn't be a bad idea to call them and just double, just really get get their take on it along with mine. Okay. <clears throat> Susan says she's buying the Calm SPF, thanks. So thankful for all your expertise and information, Brian. PC for life, that's from Samara, or Samara, if I'm saying your name wrong, as always, I apologize. Um, I think, okay, we've got a couple more minutes left. There's a couple of questions from people that asked more than one which is fine, but I just want to make sure we get in as many individuals as possible. Uh, Tatiana, my husband has dry skin and dermatitis on his cheeks. They're a little red and flaky and usually sting whenever he applies a strong active, but he has a bad habit of forgetting to wash his face. He's a guy. That's kind of typical. Um, his face always looks better after he does his skincare routine. Any products you can recommend for him for dermatitis on the cheeks? Um, I would want to make sure, Tatiana, if he hasn't seen a dermatologist to rule out rosacea, um, that he makes that appointment and gets that checked because rosacea, uh, especially in the early stages can present as reddened, sensitive, flaky skin. 
So what he may be dealing with that you're characterizing, perhaps correctly so, as dermatitis, which is kind of a catch-all term for dry, flaky skin, um, may in fact be rosacea. It is not um, uh, uncommon for, uh, for men to get rosacea. And I want to, if, if that is what he's dealing with, there are topical prescription products that his dermatologist can get him to, they can discuss, decide which one he wants to start with. And that may solve the problem in and of itself, along with adhering to a gentle skincare routine. If it is um, the, the dry skin and the dermatitis, if he's not prone to breakouts, I think a product like our Moisture Renewal Oil Booster, having him put a few drops of that on the, the, the affected areas uh, every night before going to bed, it would be better if he did that on clean skin, um, but if he's not willing to wash his face at night, you know, and he's not wearing sunscreen during the day, which if you can get him to do that, even better. Uh, and his dermatologist will absolutely recommend sunscreen if he has rosacea because sun, unprotected sun exposure is a big um, trigger for what's considered a rosacea flare, which is when you get that more marked, um, intense redness and heat, and that can lead to eventually broken capillaries and on and on and on. So um, bottom line, he needs to use something gentle, um, highly emollient, uh, and, and barrier replenishing, and our moisture renewal oil booster checks all of those boxes. Again, and I'm also making this recommendation uh, because I'm sensing that the fewer products he uses, the happier he will be. Um, but also, please make sure that he consults at least his, maybe if not a dermatologist, if it's easier for him to get in with his personal physician, uh, to have his skin examined by a medical professional and um, rule out or confirm that he may be dealing with rosacea. So that is it for me. Thank you all so much for joining. I will find out about that Skin Recovery SPF 30, uh, but I'm glad that we do have the Calm SPF 30 for normal to dry skin in stock, so you can take advantage of that. And I will see you later this month. Uh, I believe it's going to be what would be Thanksgiving week here in the United States for the second live chat of November. And until then, be good to yourselves and